we start again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heaven, the King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, wherever we're present, fills all things. Treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls with your blood. Amen. Amen. So welcome. Have a seat. Get, get comfortable, whatever. Um, the Anyway, we're, we've all been kind of talking about um, the St. James Liturgy this morning. And um, you know, one of the, the reflections, actually, that Nikos has sent me, because they had it at the seminary last night, and he sent me a comment. I was sharing this with Graham. How often the prayers link our sacrifices to the sacrifices of all the righteous people throughout all of human history back to Abel. Right, and I mean it's a point that Saint Basil makes in his Anaphora, and it's something that we sort of understand, maybe intuitively, and 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 so on. But just the explicit way that it's em- emphasized over and over again that this is the fulfillment of all of those sacrifices throughout all of human history, right, from Abel to the present. Is, it's made such an emphasis there, and it's so beautiful and, and such a powerful reminder. Um, you know, and it's, it's something, I mean, as we'll see as we get into the letter of the Hebrews, is emphasized there as well, right? And um, maybe if some, Jared, could you just close it? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so we're continuing on. We're, we're, <laughs> um, after letting myself off the hook last time and not doing the Epistle to the Hebrews, we will cover it tonight. Um, I'll just give the proviso. I, I felt that, I felt this even more so with this Epistle than some others, right? Um, I always say we're at like 60,000 foot view, right? This is just a basic introduction to the Epistle. I will be missing your favorite part of the book or Epistle. Like it's just going to happen. Resolve yourself to that now. I will disappoint you and skip your favorite part, whatever it may be. Uh, Almost guaranteed. Um, But um, the epistle to the Hebrews, you know, is the epistle that always is a big question mark, right? Because um, if you look at modern scholarship today, nearly everybody will tell you it was not written by St. Paul. The language is totally different. Um, and, um, you know, that's why it's sort of put at the end of St. Paul's epistles, right after the other epistles. Now, the first thing I would point out, um, the people who put St. Paul, uh, put the epistle to the Hebrews with the other letters of St. Paul knew Greek better than every single one of those scholars, Right? And in fact, at the time that this all started and the question of authorship began, they spoke St. Paul's Greek natively and fluently, right? So it's not like some great big thing that happens all of a sudden in the, you know, the 19th century, the 20th century, and all of these scholars with their academic degrees look at it and say, oh, look, there's some differences in the Greek, and none of the native Greek speakers ever noticed that, right? So um, that would be my first step, is that somebody whose native language was German or English or whatever other language probably missed some of the Greek differences that the native Greek speaker would have noticed back in the second or the third or the fourth centuries. All right. Now, that said, um, it is true that even in ancient times there was some discussion about whether it was really written by St. Paul. Um, we do traditionally ascribe it to St. Paul. You'll notice when we read it in the liturgy, right, a reading from the epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews, right? Um, the earliest manuscripts that we have of St. Paul's epistles, the earliest one we have is P46, Papyrus 46, okay? We can date it to about 125 to 150. It contains Hebrews, ascribes it to St. Paul, and places it between Romans and 1 Corinthians. So remember we talked, the the order of the epistles of St. Paul in our Bibles are generally just according to length, right? And with the exception of Hebrews, it gets pulled out and put to the end, largely because of 
questions over whether it was St. Paul's or not. In this early 2nd century collection of St. Paul's epistles, they put it between Romans and 1 Corinthians, squarely and clearly attributing it to St. Paul. Right? It's also, you know, it, it, it goes to show that even early on, at the end of the 1st century and the beginning of the 2nd century, St. Paul's epistles are being sent around not just individual copies, but compilations. They're already compiling his epistles and sending them around and sharing them, right? Um, Eusebius, the church historian in the 4th century, St. Athanasius, St. John Chrysostom, all attributed to St. Paul. Um, so clearly, you know, that's not to say that it was universal. There are some origin for example, wrote that the author to the, of the letter to the Hebrews is known only in heaven, <laughs> right? And they weren't sure. Some have thought maybe it was Barnabas, right, writing it, who had a different voice but had very Pauline thought, right? Um, there's been some other suggestions along the way. Um, but the, it, and here's the other piece of it, right? Um, it lacks the normal epistolary formula, right? I, Paul, to the, right, all of these kinds of things at the beginning of a letter that we see in every other letter isn't here, right? Um, what we also know, though, it was common in the ancient world for disciples to record the oratory of their teachers and to correct the grammar a little bit, right? Um, if you've ever tried to look at a transcript, of your speech. And I say this as somebody who is an attorney who has been recorded by a stenographer way more times than I can count and way more times than I ever wanted to have to read. But I would always have to read what I said, right? I'd go back and reread my opening statement or whatever in the course of a trial. Um, and you sit there wincing the whole time, like, oh my God, I can't believe I used that. You know, that's a grammatical incorrect, grammatically incorrect. That's whatever, and like, I can't believe I used that word instead of that word. I said uh, less instead of fewer, whatever, right? Like all these little things that I would never do if I were writing. Uh, and unfortunately, my court reporters never cleaned up my language, although they would actually, if you know the good ones and they like you, a lot of the ums and things kind of fall out, which is really nice. Um, anyway, but the... Uh, yeah, you, everybody has their favorite court reporters. Um, the, uh, but, but it wasn't uncommon for the disciples then to clean up their language a little bit as they recorded it. Well, the language in Hebrews, if you compare it, is actually really quite similar to St. Luke in his gospel and in Acts of the Apostles. Guess who was a disciple of St. Paul, right? Um, in fact, we know um, that right in 2 Timothy 4.11, towards the end of Paul's life in Rome, what does he say? Only Luke is with me. Right? And what it seems to be, oh, first of all, and we also know that this is written before A.D. 70. Okay? Because in 8.13, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So the Old Testament sacrifices are still going on at the time that this letter is written. And we know that that ceases in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple, right? So we know that it's before that. We know Luke was with Paul in Rome. We know that the language here tends to reflect basically Luke's usage much more closely than anything else. Um, it's reasonable to think that this is probably a sermon St. Paul preached in one of the synagogues in Rome, probably over a period of maybe a couple of days, that is recorded by St. Luke and then eventually sent from uh, the Christians in Italy to somewhere else in, in the world. It also makes sense because St. Paul in this epistle maybe more than any other assumes a great deal of familiarity with the Old Testament, right? You, you can't understand Hebrews if you don't know the Torah very, very well, right? And 
he's quoting from the Psalms extensively as well. Like, you've got to know it, right? You're smiling. Well, you think, God. Well, yeah, yeah right, <laughs> and right. Many do. Right, and many Don't do. Get lost in the weeds, exactly, really. exactly. So I, I think it's a fair uh, supposition. I mean, we can't know this for, for absolute fact. But that this is probably a homily St. Paul gave in one of the synagogues of Rome on specifically Psalm 109 that St. Luke records, cleans up, and then sends as a letter to some of the other churches um, on, on Paul's behalf. Maybe even after Paul died, right? It might be a situation that he had made notes, right, of the, of the sermon. And then he cleans it up and sends it out after St. Paul dies, right? Um, again, we know that happens. St. Anthony's is working right now on the collected life and homilies and teachings of Elder Ephraim. And much of that is them going to his closest disciples and them re reporting, you know, I remember when he gave this talk and I made notes at the time and here's what I remember him saying. And now St. Anthony's is taking that, cleaning it up and and putting it in a compilation. Does that make some sense? Um, again, we can't know this for sure. Reasonable minds can disagree. But this seems to be the most reasonable explanation that's in keeping with the sort of lived tradition of the, of the church. Um, so, Psalm 109 then. What is, he, what is he commenting on? This is 110 in the Hebrew numbering. This is also the most quoted passage of the Old Testament in the entirety of the New Testament. Okay, it gets quoted over and over again. The Lord said to my Lord, right, why, right, even remember Christ quotes this, saying, why does David call the Messiah Lord, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up his head. Right. This is the psalm of the Messiah king coming to rule, right? Um, and so one of the primary emphases that St. Paul has in this epistle is the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? He makes the point that Melchizedek's priesthood was not hereditary, unlike the Levitical priests. He was also a king. So in the same way that Christ's priesthood is not hereditary and not limited by age, he has this priesthood of Melchizedek that Psalm 109 is talking about, but it's also a kingly uh, priesthood, right? Jesus, who pre-exists all creation, combines the messianic prophecy of the son of David, the king, with the promise of a new high priesthood. And the, the point here, some of you may have heard Father Stephen DeYoung talk about this, in, in Second Temple Judaism of that time, there were these messianic string, streams, some that thought that there would be a kingly Messiah in the line of David, and who thought that maybe there would be another priest, uh, another Messiah, who would be the priestly Messiah in the order of Aaron and Levi, right? And what St. Paul is saying, this, this is behind St. John the Baptist's disciples' question to Christ, are you the one, right? Basically, what they're asking is, are you the only one, right? Are you the only one? Are you the only Messiah, or should we expect an additional Messiah, basically, right? And this is where the Moonies go completely haywire. They say St. John lost faith and was questioning whether he was really the Messiah, and that's where, like, the whole plan, that somehow frustrates Jesus' ability to actually implement his plan and that's why they need the Reverend Moon to come and fix it all in the 20th century. It's ridiculous. Um, but 
Um, but the, the point here is that he's both the kingly Messiah and the priestly Messiah. But it isn't an Aaronic priesthood. It isn't a Levitical priesthood. It's the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is not hereditary and not constrained by age. Right? Um, and as a result of that, unlike the Jewish priests, he doesn't sanctify the earthly temple. Rather, he sanctifies the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle. Right? And who can sanctify heaven? Not any priest. Certainly not a human priest. But only God himself can sanctify heaven. Right? Um, this isn't a physical temple that a human priest can just go in, even through the power of ordination, and sanctify the temple. Sanctifying the Holy of Holies in the heavens, only God can do that. Right? So there's an implicit assertion of his divinity as well in, in all of this. Um, any questions so far? But, yeah. <laughs> the, the Unification Church, they're a cult that developed in the, I forget when they exactly started, the 50s or the 60s out of Korea. They were very popular in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, including here in the Bay Area. Um, I happen to know, and actually the kids had as their, te their English teacher in 7th and 8th grade, the former head of the Mooney Church in the U.S. <laughs> So I got to know them. Um, there was this woman who stopped me in a parking lot once, and she, she, she mm -hmm. and she was trying to anyway. Um, so they believe that Jesus already came back, like as a skin man. If there's a yeah. heavenly father and heavenly mother. Yep, that's okay. the one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> hmm. Um, the rebuilt Jewish temple. So Solomon builds the temple, and then it's basically destroyed during the Babylonian. Um, uh, invasion and captivity. And then um, Ezra and Nehemiah bring captive Jews from Babylon, basically modern-day Iraq, back to the Holy Land and rebuild the temple. And that's the second temple. It's a time frame, right? It's basically the few hundred years leading up to Christ and Christ's time itself. I mean, properly speaking, Christianity is a second temple Judaism, right? Um, it comes out of that, that time period. Mm -hmm. Back to the Paul. Yeah. Um, all the previous temples are mentioned. Right. You have like the building. And then at some point during the, the invasions of the Greeks in those areas, under the Maccabean rulers, you get these sort of priestly rulers. It's where you get these high priests, chief priests within Israel that are, that are or within Judea that are kind of ruling the Jewish people. And that's where you start seeing Annas and Caiaphas and so on in the gospel. It's coming out of this Maccabean period in the second temple. And so, and it's actually helpful because there's a great deal of literature that we've really, that we've had and has been rediscovered, especially in the last 100, 150 years. A lot of it maintained actually in Orthodox monasteries that <laughs> the Western world is becoming more and more aware of. But then you also have the discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran, these types of texts that give a lot more color to what Judaism actually believed and practiced at the time of Christ. Jewish right. Have knowledge. They have knowledge too. Like, right. We don't, that's not an invention. Right. As, as the temple gets destroyed and as Judaism starts to figure out now what is this going to look like now that we can't actually do almost any of the stuff Moses actually told us to do, the most important things Moses told us to do, you see the development coming out of Pharisaism one of the Jewish sects at the time, you see the development of rabbinical Judaism, which is now basically all you have within the Jewish world. But that was just one strain of Judaism that existed at that time. Part of what they did was suppress and ban most of the Second Temple literature. 
kind of the, the literature mostly in between the Old and the New Testament because it looked way too Christian to them, right? And so if you're trying to say we're not Christians, then the best thing you can do is basically suppress all of that literature. To the extent that we have it, most of that literature that we have was actually maintained in Orthodox monasteries, and we still have a lot of those manuscripts. Um, and, and all of a sudden, when you start to read it, you start to understand a lot of pieces and nuances in the gospel that don't make sense. They don't quite match up. Like what you read the Old Testament, you go along, and then there's all of a sudden these new concepts kind of showing up in the New Testament. And you go, where did, where did unclean spirits come from, right? Or, or some of these things that you see, where did Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, what is all this stuff that we see in the gospel? that we didn't really see much references, many references to in the Old Testament. These are developments within Judaism that occurred during that intertestamental period that is totally understood and accepted within Judaism at the time. But today would be pretty foreign to Jewish folks today. Does, does that all make sense? Um, you know, it's, um, and actually it helps to understand just how Jewish our faith is. Right? Um, uh, Graham and I were talking before that you see it in the Divine Liturgy of St. James we have today. Like, it is so Jewish. <laughs> it even refers to, you know, the Mother Church of Zion as the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, right? Like, that link is so strong there. It's so clearly a liturgy written by a Jewish man, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Right, there's like a genealogy there almost, right? Like an Old Testament genealogy. I mean, it's so, the Jewishness is just so there and saturating it, which is so beautiful to see. This is a Second Temple Jewish liturgy for when the Messiah has already come, right? Um that's a clunky way to say it. Again, thank God no stenographer. Anyway, um, <laughs> but does that help? And, yeah. All right. Um, the, and the point is, he sanctifies the heavenly tabernacle. Um, what's important to remember, this is again sort of an understanding that comes really strongly out of that second temple period, which is that um, the heavenly tabernacle is what is reflected in the earthly tabernacle in the earthly temple, right? So Philo, um, a sort of almost contemporary of Christ, like he was really old when Christ was really young, kind of contemporary, uh, a Jewish man. Moses saw with the soul's eyes the immaterial ideas of the material objects of the tabernacle which were about to be made, right? In other words, he's patterning the tabernacle, the earthly temple, on what he saw of heaven on the top of the mountain, right? Um, Wisdom 9.8. You have given command to build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city of your habitation, a copy of the holy tent that you prepared from the beginning. Right? So before Moses, this is the heavenly pattern. We are, we are imaging, iconing um, the heavenly tabernacle in the way that we build the Old Testament tabernacle and the New Testament temple. What's this? I, did, I just realized, did you ever use it? Ever? Right. How? Right. How, did we, how was this lost? Right. And, and, and that's, right, exactly what St. Paul references in Hebrews when he says Moses patterned it on what he saw on the mountain, right? St. Paul is adopting this tradition and asserting it as truth, right? And we still have this in the liturgy. Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and who sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-creating trinity now lay aside all earthly cares that we may receive the king of all who comes invisibly aborn by the angelic hosts. Right? We're there. We're patterning and imaging the heavenly liturgy, the heavenly tabernacle in the divine liturgy. And it, is, it becomes an eschatological event. Right? It becomes an apocalypse. It becomes Christ appearing among us, right? Um, I, I think I've maybe mentioned this before, but I remember a, a priest I know who 
when he was in seminary, was the deacon assigned to basically serve with Father Alexander Schmemann in the final years of his life. And he talks about the fact that Father Alexander, you know, would often say the Jesus prayer, but when it came into the liturgy, in the in-between times, his prayer was simply, Maranatha, come Lord, come Lord. He saw the liturgy as this apocalyptic, eschatological, theophonic event of Christ appearing among us. Right? It is the mountaintop of Sinai and Horeb and so many others. right? And this is what St. Paul is referring to and reflecting in the epistle to the Hebrews. Um, and I think we can all adopt that sometime. right? Sometimes if we need to remind ourselves of where we are and what we're doing in the liturgy. Make that your prayer. Maranatha, come Lord. Come Lord. But what is this sacrifice, right? Um, right, St. Paul in, in uh, Hebrews 9, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So he is both, right, um, the one who is offered, but also the one who is offering, right? This is the language that St. John Chrysostom uses in the Divine Liturgy, right? Um, and it's, he offered himself up. It's a once-for-all sacrifice. Right? So what are we doing in the Divine Liturgy? The Didahi says, But every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread. So remember, the Didahi is written at latest in the 90s AD. Right? This is very, very early church. But every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanksgiving after having confessed your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. The bread that we are breaking, the bread we are offering on the Lord's Day in the gathering of the people in the liturgy is a sacrifice. Right? Very clearly asserted in the first century. But let no one that is at variance with his fellow, fellow come together with you until they be reconciled, that your sacrifice may not be profane. For this is that which was spoken by the Lord, and every place and time offer to me a pure sacrifice. For I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is wonderful among the nations. So clearly it is a sacrifice which we are commanded to offer over and over in all times. Right? And yet Christ offered himself once for all. Right? As St. John Chrysostom says, he is both the victim, the priest, and the sacrifice. So what's going on? St. John Chrysostom talks about this. He said, do we, offer every, do we not offer every day? We offer indeed, but making a remembrance of his death, and this remembrance is one and not many. How is it one and not many? Inasmuch as that sacrifice was once for all offered and carried into the Holy of Holies. This is a figure of that sacrifice and this remembrance of that. Let me pause there. Remembrance, anomnesis. Remember, the understanding is that this is not just calling it to mind like, oh, I remember the time I, you know, whatever. It's a making present as a result of that commemoration. Right? Maybe that's the difference, is that it's not just a remembering, but a commemoration, and becomes now a making present of it and a participation in it. Right? It is not just a remember the time. Right? Um, for we always offer the same, not one sheep now and tomorrow another, but always the same thing, so that the sacrifice is one. And yet by this reasoning, since the offering is made in many places, are there many Christs? But Christ is one everywhere, being complete here and complete there also, one body. As then, while offered in many places, he is one body and not many bodies. So also he is one sacrifice. He is our high priest who offered the sacrifice that cleanses us, that we offer now also, which was then offered, which cannot be exhausted. This is done in remembrance of what was then done. For says he, do this in remembrance of me, right? That's what that do this in remembrance of me means. It's not we remember Jesus in the same way that like, you know, we have a, um, 
a D-Day memorial. And like, you know, on that day we hang a wreath and we remembered D-Day, right? It's not that. It's a making present of it. Because he says, do this in remembrance of me. So we, in remembrance of him and in commemoration of him, we're doing the same thing he did. But it becomes then a participation in that one thing he did, his sacrifice on the cross. It is not another sacrifice as the high priest, but we offer always the same, or rather we perform a remembrance of a sacrifice, an amnesis. Does this make sense? Right? This is why the priest can say in the divine liturgy, remembering therefore these things, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, his ascension into heaven, and his second and glorious coming. Right? He remembers in the same way both the death of Christ his resurrection, and his second coming that has not happened yet. Right? Because it's a making present of an eternal reality. Fine. It's exactly. We, well, it's, it's us entering into it. Right? We enter it rather than it entering us. Right, right. Um, because then, through the Eucharist, we become what we eat. Right? You know, that old saying, you are what you eat, only place that that's really, really true is in the Eucharist. And it's referring not just to you and me individually, but to us also as the group, right? This is why St. Paul calls the church the body of Christ, is because together, through the Eucharist, through our reception of the body of Christ, we become, we constitute what we have received. We are incorporated into him, not him into us, right? It's the only thing... Right, when I eat a head of broccoli, right, all of those nutrients and so on become incorporated into me. Right? When I receive the Eucharist, I become incorporated to it. It goes the other way. Right? We become part of Christ. Um, does all of this make some sense? Right? It's I mean, it's a great mystery, right? It it is a mystery. We're entering into the mystery. But th this is one of the primary um, objections we get, right, from many Western Christians is that the Eucharist is not a sacrifice. Um, sacrifice all went away. And actually, that's not the case at all. The sacrifice didn't go away. The sacrifice is fulfilled. And now there is only one sacrifice, but we're commanded to continue to offer it, right? Um, yeah, right. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It stands as the axis around which all time and space turn. Um, and so we then are able to recapitulate and make present again and again and again the same one sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, you go back to his dialogue with the Samaritan woman, right, where he says it will be offered, the sacrifice will be offered in all places, and we, they will worship in spirit. The worship will be offered in all places, and they will worship in spirit and truth, right? And that in spirit and truth doesn't mean just sort of mentally, right, but rather in the Holy Spirit and in Christ who is the truth, right? And so when the sacrifice is done in Christ and is Christ himself, then it can be offered in, in all of these places, right? Um, and at the same time, um, that is why we still nevertheless build churches, right? Um, I forget who said it. Maybe one of the modern elders, you know, made the point. Um, yes. 
there's water, there's H2O chemically all over the place. But when you want to drink, you go to a fountain, right? Is God everywhere present? Yes. But we still go to the church to worship and pray, right, where we gather and where it's maybe more concentrated. And the reality is anybody knows that that's the case. Like I, <clears throat> I'll never forget a, a coworker of mine um, who I think probably would have described herself as maybe agnostic, maybe atheist, probably spiritual but not religious, kind of, you know, that whole Gen X business. Um, and um, I'll never forget her telling, she was raised without any religion, kind of, I think she sort of said basically the daughter of hippies in the Santa Cruz Mountains, that kind of thing, right? <clears throat> um, I'll never forget she was in St. Louis for work for some depositions, and she commented that she was just sort of walking around one time when she had some extra time, and she went into the Roman Catholic Cathedral in St. Louis. It's beautiful. I mean, the, the mosaics are gorgeous. It's just a very... Very beautiful, one of the few modern, beautiful Catholic churches anymore, right? Um, or recently built ones. And anyway, she goes in, she said she couldn't even make it past the narthex, just looking up towards the apse before she began weeping. She just knew this was a place that is thin, right? Tolkien's kind of comments, like it's just this thin place where something was breaking through. And um, she spent a long time just sort of looking, and crying. And I don't know if she ever even made a full tour. Um, but we know that, right? We know that. And, and then you read the stories of St. John of San Francisco when he was the bishop of Western Europe, going to many of these ancient or old medieval you know, Catholic and Anglican churches. And, you know, the ones where the relics of the saints were present, he'd walk in and could immediately tell there was still some grace here. And the ones where there weren't, he would step foot and say, there's no grace here anymore. And he would just turn around and walk out. But when he could walk in and feel the grace, he would immediately walk in and start looking towards the relics. I know that there's still something holy here. And he would find the saints, and he would venerate them, and uh, try to research their lives. Right? So, you know, in one sense it's everywhere, and in another sense we we still gather in an upper room, <laughs> right? Or in the, the, the church in so-and-so's home, right? That, that sort of tradition that we see even in the New, the New Testament already developing, there are specific meeting places where the synaxis, the gathering, the liturgy takes place. Yeah, Sarah? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, um, in theory, generally, yes. I don't know how strict they are. I'll, I'll confess, I don't know how strict they are anymore of making sure that there are relics in every altar. Um, they used to have like altar stones even for traveling masses. Um, they don't really follow that anymore. So I don't know. But some of them at least do. And, you know, and then there's the secondary question of how many of those saints would we recognize as saints and not? And does that, how much does that matter? All that sort of, I don't want to get into that right now. Yeah, that's another one. Sometimes you won't often find them put out for veneration. You know, um, you won't find much there. I mean, some pla again, some places, right? But like even, think about it. Like St. John, right? His relics are there, and you can walk right up and kiss his reliquary, right? In many of the churches in Western Europe, you know, even among the saints that the, whose bodies are there in the church or something, you're kind of walking past it. Like you're not, that. yeah. I mean, I was really surprised by that. Yeah. And yeah. the idea of like veneration to a part of the church, yeah. just by looking 
And it and it didn't used to be that way in the Catholic Church, and I would be very interested, just sort of as I, as I'm thinking aloud, how much of the development of Eucharistic adoration in the West, where you look at the Eucharist rather than receive it, influenced then the rest of their piety, where now you look at the relics rather than touch and venerate and kiss, right? These kinds of things, yeah. There's sort of this now separation that has taken place there, and I wonder how much of that influence there is there. I, that's rank speculation on my part, but you can kind of see maybe how that could happen. Yeah. Well, with like, I think in general their piety is more aligned with, with ours. Um, I can't I don't remember during my time worshiping in Eastern Catholic churches that there were really relics available for veneration. How much of that was the fact that, like, the church in San Francisco I attended, the priest was a Western Jesuit who just had a mission to celebrate the Eastern liturgies, so he's still formed in that Western world, but serving the lit I don't know, right? Um, versus what you might find, like if you go to Ukraine or Syria to one of the, the Eastern Catholic churches there, maybe it's more organic. Um, I don't know. In, in Eastern Europe in particular, there was a very heavy push to Latinize, even to the point of developing like Eastern Catholic Eucharistic adoration rites and things of this nature, which is so foreign to us. Um, I don't know, you know, I haven't spent time in those areas to be able to say how much of the piety still is the same. I think in the Middle East with the Melkites, you're probably more likely to see a similar piety because they, they came into the Catholic Church much later. Um, but it's hard to say. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't want to guess. Yeah. something about instead of A major part of Catholic piety. They will take the consecrated host and put it into a little circular display case and people will go and pray and kneel and look at the Eucharist. And I think a piece of it is that they lost, it has a couple of things. One, they lost in large part, never really developed all that strongly, a, a tradition of iconography in the West. They were always a little bit more standoffish. It's why you can find like all these Catholic, you know, large Baroque cathedrals that are gorgeous architecture, all extremely high up and pointed and vaulted in a way, but there's no real imagery in a lot of them, right? It's very plain. Actually, the old cathedral in St. Louis is this way. It's this old French Baroque style, not Baroque, uh, French uh, Romance style, and like it's plain. It's very plain. Um, so it's that combined with the Protestants denying the fact that it really is the body and blood of Christ. And so the Catholics, to combat that, said, we're going to have everybody adore and worship the consecrated um, no, the, the host um, as a way to assert and clarify, we really do believe this is the body and blood of Christ. And I mean, we show that devotion for the Eucharist. Think of how we treat it in the pre-sanctified liturgy. But the point of the Eucharist is to be eaten, not to be looked at, right? And so I think, I think those strains kind of come together some. Mm -hmm. Like St. Nicholas of Bari. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. We were talking last week today about the Dora, mm -hmm. the Empress, and some of this is because of all the history and conquest and mm -hmm. stuff, but some of it is because somewhere. Right. 
what what happened is a lot of times, you know, during Muslim uh, conquests, uh, a lot of times things were sent to Constantinople for safety initially. And then as Constantinople and those areas started to become an issue, they started sending them places west. Um, and then the Crusaders came and decided to start helping themselves and took what was left, you know. Right. Yeah. Oh, the canal is pretty boat. Like, right, right. Holy St. Mark's is a treasure trove right. and, and so many other places. So, I mean, even um, <clears throat> Saint, I mean, uh, Metropolitan Serracios in San Jose, when he was in Buenos Aires, um, knew then Cardinal Bergoglio, now Pope Francis, because they were both in Buenos Aires at the same time. And when Francis became Pope, Serracios went to him and said, Hey, um, is there any chance I can get a piece of the relics of St. Rasios, the former patriarch of Constantinople? And the Pope asked him, do we have them? And he says, yeah, you know, the Fourth Crusade, you guys came in. And, <laughs> and before he could say anything, Francis just stopped him and said, look, let's not get into all that right now. I'll see what I can do. Where are they? He told him the church where they were contained now. And he said, let me see what I can do. So Tarasios goes back to Buenos Aires. And like three months later, he gets a phone call from the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Buenos Aires. And they said, is this Metropolitan Tarasios? Yeah, it is. They said, um, we have a gift for you from the Vatican. Uh, you know, can you come by and pick it up? This is okay. And at this point, like, it was such an afterthought. He didn't even think about it. And he shows up at the diocese, and they hand him a little reliquary box that has the entire forearm of St. Tarasios. And so um, he has it with him in San Jose now. And it is the only place that the Orthodox Church still has the relics of St. Tadasius. Right? Pretty incredible. Um, so there's still a process of trying to get some of these relics back. Um, uh, prominently, they returned, I think, the relics of St. John Chrysostom and St. Gregory the Theologian recently. Um, we've had some of the relics of St. Nicholas come back to us from Bari. Um, we're working on. We there is no official position. Okay. So, um, I think the only thing that I would say about it is that there's no tradition that comes down to us about the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. If the early church had it, you would think that that would be something that they would mention a bunch, right? We have stories of the belt of the Theotokos, right? Her robe. Um, we have various other references to, you know, the nails, the crown of thorns, the cross, the, right? All of these things. There's not really any tradition referencing his burial shroud. So, it causes me to wonder, right? I would also say on that issue, I don't care because I receive his body and blood every day or every week, right? And so that's a lot more important to me than his burial shroud. Right? You are more a relic than any shroud in that sense, right? In terms of something that has touched the body of Christ, you are more a relic than, than that. Um, you know, the chalice that, that I handle at every liturgy is as much, if not more so, a relic of any shroud. Right? Um, anyway, any other questions or I'll move on a little bit? Um, the... The other thing that I'll, I'll just point out is that how do we enter this mystery? How do we participate in the mystery of Christ and his sacrifice and become ourselves sanctified and incorporated into it? St. Paul makes this point over and over and over again. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. How do we become partakers of Christ? Not 
by doing it once at some point in our life, but by holding fast to it to the end. Right? It's not a one and done thing. St. Paul goes on then, right? Especially in chapter 13. What does he then tell them to do? If we want to be partakers of Christ and partakers of this mystery and the sacrifice, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. So we already have, right? Loving others, hospitality, visiting the prisoners, and others who are mistreated, chastity, um, lack of covetousness, and, and desire for material possessions. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about the various and strange doctrines, right? So submit ourselves to our hierarchy and to the teachings of the church and, um, and, and do not get carried away with all sorts of different teachings, right? Um, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, right? Giving thanks, the Eucharist, right? But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us. Right? This is the faithfulness that St. Paul is referring in the holding fast until the end. By the way, on this point, have you ever noticed that on clergy stoles, both a deacon, but especially a priest and a bishop, there are those little tassels at the bottom, right? In a couple of different places many times. Do you know what those are? They're a reminder to the priest. That those are the souls of the people who are clinging to his priestly ministry, to his diaconal ministry, to his episcopal ministry. Those are the souls for which he will give an account. Um, when, when your priest, your spiritual father, lifts up that stole and places it over your head to read the prayers of absolution, you stay with that stole as that little tassel there. Um, it's, it's a pretty powerful reminder to each clergyman as he puts that on. Right? What's his responsibility? Right? And that each of those people that he's going to look out and see in that congregation are there clinging to that Petrahili, to that Orarion, um, and that he will give an account for those people. Right? Yeah. Are you sure? Um, you know, especially the priest, right? When a priest is ordained um, after the consecration, the new priest, so the priest is ordained right after the great entrance, right? But then after the consecration of the gifts, the bishop will then take the, the lamb, the body of Christ, and place it into the hands of the newly ordained priest. And the bishop will say, receive this deposit of the faith, which will be asked of you again on the second, in the second coming of the Lord before his fearsome and awesome judgment seat. Um, and then the priest is sent to go stand behind the altar, silently holding the body of Christ which has now been entrusted to him. By that, it doesn't mean just the Eucharist. It means the whole body, right? All of the people that he's now to minister to. And then finally, at, 
um, just before communion, he brings it over to the bishop who then takes it from his hands and lifts it from his hands to say holy things for the holy people of God. Um, most priests I've talked to say that's the most powerful moment of their ordination and it's something that they go back to over and over and over again until the day they die. Right? The realization of what's being entrusted to them. Um, anyway, and that all goes back to this, I mean, to many things, right? Um, the, the Christ talking about him being the good shepherd and so on, and what a good shepherd is. <clears throat> but it's also this line here that um, for those who have authority over us in the church, watch out for our souls and must give an account for them. Um, great, you know, the, the, um, the old Christian um, story of St. Theodora and her journey through the afterlife to, you know, um, basically the particular judgment with the image of the, the toll houses in the story, right? She's continually saying, through the prayers of my spiritual father, I was able to move forward, right, basically. The priest, through her spiritual father, through hearing her confession, through praying for her, and through taking an account for her, she was given greater leniency and mercy um, by Christ. Um, you know, many, bless you. Um, you know, there's stories of, um, you know, many of the saints when they're getting into difficulty. In fact, I was reading, I was reading actually that, uh, an interview with Yorona Sue Markello the other day, I think I sent to some of you, right? And she says that like any time she was having trouble, all she had to do was bring to mind her spiritual father, Elder Ephraim, and the issue would re be resolved in one way or another. Right? And um, you know, not all of us have spirit-bearing elders and great saints and spiritual fathers. It doesn't matter. It's, it's totally appropriate at times to say, through the prayers of my spiritual father, Lord, help me. Right? Moments especially of temptation, moments of wanting to give up or you know, throw in the towel, these kinds of things. If you're not able to see your spiritual father right away for advice on these things, it's totally appropriate to say, Lord, through the prayers of my spiritual father, um, help me with this. Have mercy on me. And, um, and you'll find an amazing thing, that, that there is that little help. And many spiritual fathers will attest to having heard stories of situations where their spiritual children were struggling. And were saying, through the prayers of my spiritual father, Lord, have mercy on me. And totally unbeknownst to even to the spiritual father, there was some little, you know, prodding, probably from his guardian angel, that person would just come to mind and they'd say a quick little prayer for them and then carry on in their day. And that's exactly what happened. Right? Um, in fact, many of the saints say that for all of us. When somebody comes to our mind out of the blue, it's because they need prayer. God has appointed you to be the one to pray for them. Right? He's given you the honor and the responsibility to be the one to pray for them because they need it right now. How often do we ignore that? Right? We just sort of move on in our day. Right? Somebody comes to mind, either we ignore it, or we start thinking about something totally unprayerful about them, right? We just sort of like move on. But what's happening is God has sent your whole guardian angel to poke you and say, pray for your brother, pray for your sister right now. And if we do that, what an incredible honor we've been given, right? It's why St. Paul says over and over and over again in his epistles, pray for one another, right? We are accountable and connected to each other in the body of Christ. And in the same way that St. Paul says, right, when one member rejoices, all the members rejoice. When one member is sorrowing, all of the members are sorrowing, right? We're being given a responsibility and an incredible honor to be our brother's keeper, to be able to strengthen our brothers and sisters, even when they don't know it, we don't even know what we're doing for them, right? But in that moment when the person comes to mind, just say a quick prayer for them. It doesn't have to be a lot. 
Maybe it is. Sometimes you'll be convicted, right? You will know so-and-so needs a lot of prayer right now. That's when you pull out the prayer rope and give them the whole prayer rope, right? But, but sometimes it's just a fleeting little thing, right? You get a little prod. You remember somebody. Say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy in your servant. Illumine them. And move on. And I'm fully convinced that when we get to heaven, and when we see what God has done throughout history, through those networks and connections, all of the graces, all of the mercies that he dispensed because of those prayers, right? And the way that he used us to affect the lives of so many more people than we ever thought, just by those little prayers throughout the day, right? I remember a, a priest in confession many, many, many years ago commenting. He was like, even, even the people that we pass in the day when we have <clears throat> the judgmental thought, right? Oh my goodness, what are they? <laughs> Look at those, I don't know, those tattoos. Look at those piercings. Look, this poor person is, is strung out of their mind, right? They're high as a kite right now, or they're, 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 they're fat, they're slow. I mean, whatever it is, right? Can you just say, Lord, have mercy on them, and through their prayers, have mercy on me. And all of a sudden now, rather than being a source of such negative energy, and, and um, you know, which is really, I mean, a, a demonic force in the world, right? Through our criticism, through our judgment, <clears throat> and so on. Now, all of a sudden, we become precisely what those saints were that we read about, where they would walk through their life, and the miracles would just start happening, right? I mean, yeah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and it yeah. doesn't mean you're supposed to do something astonishing <clears throat> and huge, but right. walk around their eyes and it's just astounding. Yeah. Yeah. But think then, I mean, what an what an honor that is, right? That God has appointed us quite literally his emissaries in that way. Right? Right, right. I mean, and I think this is the problem is in our American way of thinking about it, that's become I have to go everywhere and talk to everybody about all these things. It's actually the opposite. Walk through life just praying for everyone, right? And see what a difference that'll make, right? Not to mention the fact, <clears throat> do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels. Uh, one of my favorite stories, um, and I'll probably get it a little bit wrong, but uh, Father Trefone up in, in Seattle tells a story, or Vashon Island tells a story one time of he's a young deacon walking with the bishop in San Francisco. <clears throat> and they're walking down the um, sidewalk, and he looks up and sees this guy coming to them, coming towards them, that is filthy <clears throat> and bedraggled and um, clearly, you know, got all of these issues and problems and, and so on. And his natural instinct as a deacon is he sort of steps in front of the bishop, sort of between him and this guy. And in that moment, as the guy passes them, he looks up at Father Trifon and has the most incredible, incredible, clear, beautiful, kind, joyous eyes he's ever seen. And looks right through him right, to the depths of him in just that quick little glance and then looks away and keeps going. And Father Trifon mentions it to the bishop right in that moment. And the bishop says, you lost your chance. That was an angel. That was an angel. And you've missed that divine appointment to, to actually interact with an angel. Because they, they walk, I should have added this, they, they only walked a little bit further. Father Trifon turns around, the guy's gone. It was an angel. But because of our prejudgment and because of all the things that we do, 
we miss this chance often to unwittingly entertain our lives. And since we don't know who we interact with, might be those angels like Abraham did. Abraham didn't know he was entertaining angels. He just laid out the spread the way he always did. Right? And in the same way as we interact with people, we don't know who we're going to encounter and what we might actually be encountering and what Christ is sending our way. Um, it transforms the entire way of looking at how we exist and interact with the world around us. Right? Um, but then you stop and think, isn't that exactly how Christ must have walked through this world, right? Um, anyway, an incredible blessing. Any other questions or, or comments or thoughts? It is truly me to call you blessed that thou tokest ever blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable in the cherubim, more glorious man compared in the seraphim. You without corruption gave birth to God the word, and a truly thou tokest you to remain. Amen.